Um, and now we introduce tonight's speaker, Matteo Sansoni, who's spoken many times at the Business of Florence, our resident uh, historian of Italian opera, um, Pugliese by birth, Florentine by adoption, and British by education. He uh, did his PhD at Edinburgh University, where he taught for many years, also at St. Andrews, before returning to Florence, where he taught for a long time uh, on at the program of New York University uh, on the history of, of opera in Italy. So he's a, a genuine expert. He also plays the piano. So we're going to hear a little bit of live music, a fragment, only a fragment, as well as some recorded music. Um, so I hand you over to Matteo for his lecture on the madness in romantic opera. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> can you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, composers have always considered the expression of mental arrangement as a major challenge to their creativity. Many operas evidence uh, the different ways of uh, portraying a character in a state of psychosis and conjure up the relevant context on stage. Uh, before I approach the subject of uh, mad scenes in the music theater, I would like to start introducing one theme, la follia, which defines an incredibly large amount of European instrumental music. La Folia, spelled with one, one L, was a Portuguese male melody dating back to the 16th century. It was originally a popular song and dance uh, implying wild fun, revelry. In the following centuries, major musicians adopted La Folia as a theme for variations. It gave them a chance to unleash their imagination, go wild, which resulted in very demanding virtuoso pieces. Arcangelo Corelli, a major Baroque composer, wrote one of the earliest and most successful sets of variations on La Follia for the violin published in 1700. I prefer to show you this violin sonata by Antonio Vivaldi dated 1705. You will see why later on. Actually, the way Vivaldi states that motif turns it into a somber tune, not funny at all. This is the original uh, motif. Vivaldi wants the two violins and the harpsichord to play it adagio and forte. Etc. Sorry, like this. Uh, I should also mention similar compositions by Jean Baptiste Lully or Giovanni Battista Lully, he was a Florentine by birth, Handel, Francesco Geminiani, active in London, Antonio Salieri, Mozart's famous uh, rival, who wrote 26 beautiful variations for orchestra. And then Franz Liszt, and in the 20th century, Rachmaninoff. In 1931, he composed a set of 20 piano variations and wrongly attributed, as you can see, the Folia theme to Corelli. Coming to the expression of insanity in the music theater, the creative process of an opera starts with the choice of a literary text, a poem, a play, a novel to be turned into a libretto and set to music. Well, I must make a special case for the epic poem Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto, dating back to 1516. Because throughout the 18th century, this Renaissance masterpiece proved a precious source of liberty for many operas in and outside Italy. 
Now, I don't want to take you too far back in time. Let me just say that the poem focuses on the paladin Orlando, nephew of Charlemagne. He is driven mad, furioso, by his love for the beautiful Angelica, who prefers another man, Medoro. Uh, here, the two young lovers carve their names on trees, very romantic. Uh, Orlando finds out about them and loses his wits. In a fit, he strips of his armor. His friend Astolfo, who incidentally is an English knight, volunteers to recover Orlando's wits and flies on a flaming chariot to the moon, where all things lost on earth end up. He locates the wits in a bottle and makes Orlando inhale them. Mission accomplished. This is an illustration by Gustave Doré uh, from an 1894 edition of the poem. Actually, Astolfo's flight does not appear in any of the overs based on Ariosto's poem. I will mention two of them with impressive mad scenes. One by Vivaldi, and it's Orlando Furioso, Venice 1727. Here he makes Orlando sing the follia motif. I quoted earlier. Orlando says, La follia d'Orlando. Then he, he sings in French. I mean, he's really crazy. And then he quotes, he sings that motif. Uh, one by Handel, premiered at the King's Theatre in London in 1733. Note the libretto in Italian, da rappresentarsi nel Regio Teatro dei Market. In both operas, the title role is cast as a contralto, which originally meant a castrato singer. Throughout the 18th century, castrato singers were most fashionable all over Europe for leading roles in operas. One of the most famous castrati, Francesco Bernardi, known as Il Senesino, was born in Siena, uh, was active in London and sang in many of Handel's operas, including the title role of Orlando, at the King's Theatre. In modern productions, the problem of casting castrato roles is most frequently solved with the choice of countertenors. In the case of demanding title roles like Orlando, an alternative can be the mezzo soprano. This is the case of the American mezzo, Marilyn Horn, who sang Orlando in both Handel's and Vivaldi's settings. Here she is in a brief sequence from the mad scene of Vivaldi's opera. In an expressive recitative, Orlando comments on the names carved on trees, then he gets furious and starts stripping.
<laughs> and so on. Uh, then there is another mad scene where she or he uh, uh, sings the uh, Follia motif. Uh, anyway, as the 18th century progressed, it was the age of reason, the Enlightenment, the expression of madness in opera was often taken lightly as a pretext for humorous situations that would lead to a happy end. This is the case of Orlando Palladino by Franz Josef Haydn, the great symphonist. His drama Eroicomico, dated 1782, was widely popular. It approaches Orlando's madness with humor and irony. Another highly successful work was Giovanni Paesiello, uh, Nina Osia La Pazza per Amore, as you can see, 1789, one of the best examples of 18th century sentimental comedy. Its subject derives from a French opera comique, Nina ou la Folle par Amour, by Nicolas Marie d'Alayrac, well known also in London as Nina or the Love Distressed Maid. The 19th century witnessed the development of psychology as a scientific discipline and the emergence of humanitarian psychiatry. In the new cultural context, the most poignant mad scenes of romantic opera could be of some interest for the new disciplines. Take the case of Lucia di Larmamur. The murder she commits, her ensuing madness and death can be interpreted as a means through which a woman breaks the shackles of confinement in a cruel male dominated society. At the time of Lucia's composition, madness was represented musically by vocal virtuosity and coloratura, meaning florid ornamented vocal lines. Since these features were generally restricted to the soprano voice, they also came to represent a link between madness and femininity. As the stereotype of the mad woman grew to pervade the genre of romantic melodrama, the operatic uh, diva became synonymous with the notion of insanity. Lucia, like other operatic mad women, largely reflected the common belief that all women were prone to nervousness, hysteria, and mental breakdown. On Lucia's hysteria, I would like to quote a study by a major feminist critic, the French scholar Catherine Clément, who wrote L'Opéra ou la Défaite des Femmes, Opera or the Undoing of Women in 1979. Quote, they will tell you that hysteria is a sickness, that since the time of the Greeks, everyone has known about a little hedgehog circulating in women's bodies, that every woman is sick. You have seen them, you have heard them, these sick women, moaning, weeping, screaming, and finally falling down in defeat. Do not believe it. Hysteria is woman's principal resource. It is in hysterical delirium that she returns to the past, that she hurtles to the future, that all times are present for her." End of quote. This is apparent in Lucia and two more operas, which by general consent contain the most powerful scenes of mental derangement. One is by Donizetti himself, Anna Polena. The operatic character is very close to the historical figure whose mental disorder is documented by letters from the Constable of the Tower of London, where she was imprisoned with charges of treason and illicit intercourse. The historical characters involved in the opera are Anna's former lover, Henry Percy, King Henry VIII, Jane Seymour, and the action ends with Anna's execution in the Tower of London. Her mad scene occurs at the end of the opera. Anna recalls her happy time with Percy, then she claims that it is her wedding day and the king is waiting for her. All at once, the sound of cannon and bells heralds the wedding of Eddie VIII and Jane Seymour. This produces a shock that restores Anna's reason and she launches into an invective against the coppia iniqua, the wicked couple. That is the last section of the mad scene, displaying an impressive coloratura. I chose a recording with the Russian soprano Anna Netrebko. 
you will hear her again in the next two operas I'm going to quote. At the end of her song, you will notice that she lifts her hair for the executioner's sword. Guess who is the little girl who is walking up to the dying Anna Bolina? Uh, the other most famous mad scene can be found in Bellini's I Puritani. Sorry. Uh, premiered in Paris eight months before Lucia in January 1835. This circumstance has led some critics to argue that Donizetti owes something to Bellini in the way he arranged Lucia's mad scene. As you can see, the original title was I Puritani e i Cavalieri. Indeed, some, the source of the libretto by Carlo Pepoli was a French play, Tête Ronde et Cavalier, Roundheads and Cavaliers. The plot centers on the apparent mismatch between a cavalier, Arturo, and Elvira, the daughter of a Puritan. Elvira's father has approved the wedding, which is about to be celebrated, when it turns out that the bridegroom has disappeared with another woman, giving no reason to the bride-to-be, who, in despair, goes mad. In fact, Arturo has just found out that a female prisoner in the castle 
is none other than Queen Henrietta, the widow of Charles I. And he felt to be his duty to smuggle her out of the castle to save her life. On his return, the Puritans arrest Arturo and sentence him to death. But a, a herald brings a message from Cromwell. The Stuarts have been defeated and the general amnesty has been declared. So Arturo and Elvira are reunited and can get married. Let me first sum up the structure of a standard Shena, what we call the four movement uh, Shena. First, the recitative that sets the context. Then an aria or cantabile, usually slow and lyrical. One more recitative section leads to a second aria or cabaletta, cabaletta, faster and more animated. Anna Bolena's invective is a cabaletta. Clearly, in the case of a mad scene, the composer would break this, this rigid and predictable sequence, a sort of straight jacket, to allow for the expression of erratic feelings and emotions. Now, the scena starts with just a few lines of recitative. We hear Elvira before she appears on stage. Sir Giorgio, you, you have these names on the end up. Sir Giorgio, her uncle, and Sir Ricardo, Sir Richard IV whose love Elvira did not reciprocate, expressed their concern and sympathy. Sorry. So it's again Anna Netrebko. This is Ricardo and this is Giorgio, Elvira's uncle. In the Cantabile, Elvira laments that Arturo abandoned.
I'll skip the rest of the cantabile and I'll move on to the cabaletta, where we see a change of mood. Alvira gets excited and addresses Arturo directly as if he were there. Uh, here, Netrebko chooses to sing the da capo of the cabaletta, the repeat of the cabaletta, lying down on her back and leaning over the orchestra pit, a most uncomfortable position. It's her own choice. She's also a great actress, besides being. So here she is. da capo di Cavaletti.
so much for i puritani the happy end was obligatory in a melodrama serio that's the category that is not the case with lucia di lammermoor which is a drama tragico before i go on to show you lucia's mad scene i have to say something on donizetti this is his portrait by giuseppe rillosi uh, where he still looks in good health Unfortunately, he contracted neurosyphilis just before he got married. At the time, there was no treatment for that disease. Then Donizetti lost his wife and three premature babies. The disease progressed while he was in France to the point that his nephew, Andrea, and some Parisian specialists decided to lock him up in a mental asylum at Ivry. Ivry is near Paris. He remained there for about 17 months, his mental and physical conditions deteriorating further. Eventually, his nephew took him back to Bergamo, his own town. Donizetti spent his last few months in the residence of a very good friend, the Baroness Rosa Basoni Scotti, who, could, who took good care of him. There, he died in a state of mental derangement. This painting by Ponziano Loverini, a Bergamask artist, shows Giovannina Basoni, the daughter of the Baroness, who spent hours at the piano playing Donizetti's music while they all watched for any response for the sick man. But now let's move on to Lucia. Its source is the Bride of Lammermoor. Scott's novel inspired other composers before Donizetti. The plot centers on the antagonism between two Scottish families, the Ashtons and the Ravenswoods. Lucia loves a Ravenswood, Edgardo, but their family wants her to marry Arthur Barclaw for political reasons. Her brother Enrico forces her to sign the marriage contract. However, Soon after the bride and bridegroom have led the wedding guests to retire to their room, the chaplain Raimondo reports that Lucia has stabbed Baclo to death. In the novel, he survives. I would like to quote the relevant passage from the novel as it really reads like stage directions for the choral scena that leads to Lucia's mad scene. I'm showing Lucia mad scene only. I'm not showing its record, recording of the choral scena because it would take too long. So if you read with me, especially the first few lines, the instruments now play the loudest strains. The dancers pursue their exercise with all the enthusiasm inspired by youth, mirth, and high spirits. When a cry was heard, so shrill and piercing as at once to arrest the dance and the music, all stood motionless. But when the yell was again repeated, Colonel Ashton snatched the torch from the scones and demanding the key of the bridal chamber from Henry, to whom, as bridesman, it had been entrusted, rushed thither, followed by Sir William Ashton and Lady Ashton. So you see, here are all the characters who do not go into the opera, except for one, Henry Enrico. Let's move on to the next paragraph. Arrived at the door of the apartment, Colonel Ashton knocked and called, but received no answer except stifled groans. He hesitated no longer to open the door of the apartment, in which he found opposition from something which lay against it. When he had succeeded in opening it, the body of the bridegroom was found lying on the threshold of, threshold of the bridal chamber, and all around was flooded with blood. In the meanwhile, Lady Ashton, her husband, their assistants, in vain sought loose in the bridal bed and in the chamber. There was no private passage from the room, and they began to think that she must have thrown herself from the window. When one old company, holding his torch lower than the rest, discovered something white in the corner of the great old-fashioned chimney of the apartment, here they found the unfortunate girl, seated or rather couched like a hare on its form, her head gear disheveled, her night clothes torn and dabbled with blood, 
Her eyes glazed and her features convulsed into a wild paroxysm of insanity. When she saw herself discovered, she gibbered, made mouths and pointed at them with her bloody fingers, with the friending gestures of an exulting demoniac. This is a period uh, painting of the unfortunate, unfortunate girl. Well, in the opera, Lucia's mental derangement leads her to experience an alternative reality. Uh, she raves about her wedding. She's going to marry Edgardo and relish the love she was denied in a sort of ecstasy. One could speculate that Donizetti's brain disease may have had an influence on his ability to create the powerful scenes of psychosis in his operas. His choice of a particular instrument seems to support this hypothesis. I'm referring to the glass harmonica, which you have on the handout with some basic information. This instrument has never been part of a standard orchestra. It consists of a set of glass bowls, each with a different pitch, fitted on an iron rod attached to a wheel, which is turned by a foot pedal. Rubbing the spinning bowls uh, with slightly wet fingers produces tuneful sounds. Over the years, some disturbing events began to be associated with that instrument. Some harmonica players became ill and had to stop playing the instrument. They complained of muscle spasms, nervousness, cramps, and dizziness. On the other hand, a few listeners were the victims of nasty effects, which helped to support rumors that the glass harmonica could induce insanity. Maybe Donizetti knew about all this. Be that as it may, the glass harmonica was Donizetti's first choice. Eventually, the Teatro San Carlo in Naples, where Lucia was to premiere, had a legal dispute with the glass harmonic player they, had, they were to engage. So Donizetti had to rearrange that part for the flute. The flute is present in standard performances all over, all over the world nowadays. Unless the conductor specifically requires a glass harmonica. In that case, the opera company has to hire both the player and the instrument. I chose a Metropolitan Opera recording with Anna Netrebko, again, as Lucia, and the glass harmonica in the orchestra. So now remember the four movement scena, because I'm playing it all. The scena starts with an extended recitative set in C minor. The glass harmonica insists on one note. So C minor. This note. G, 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 the dominant, the dominant of the uh, key of C minor. And you will hear it again, over and over again. Uh, it, it becomes a sort, it renders musically the state, the, the, the condition of the, of the girl. Um, right. That is Raimondo by Ben Chaplin. Now listen to the G G. Oh. 
again the glass harmonica. I, I'll skip. The, it's a long, re, long recitative, abnormally long because uh, Donizetti thinks that she he must give her all the space she needs. Now let's move on to the cantabile Ardon Lincenzi, and here Lucia hallucinates her wedding with Edgardo. Donizetti set the aria as a sort of slow waltz. Do get um pa pa um pa. At the end, the orchestra is silent and the voice goes on a cadenza with just the flute. In a sort of suspense, the mad woman's screams are echoed by the instrument. In fact, Donizetti did not write that cadenza because he trusted the first interpreter of the role, Fanny Tacchinardi Persiani, to do it her own way. Her powers of improvisation were legendary. Many years later, decades later, someone else wrote what is now the standard cadenza for voice and flute. The identity of its author is still a matter of debate. So I'll play now the, the whole cantabile. <laughs> a wedding, a wedding ceremony. Glass harmonica.
the cadenza and voice, not by Don Cristo. Uh, we now move to the next movement in the Scena, number three. And uh, uh, because now Enrico, a brother, arrives very aggressive and she mistakes him for Edgardo. The chorus contributes to heighten the tension leading to Lucia's final cabaletta. So let's uh, just play a little bit of it. Oh, here it is. She wants to kiss Edgardo, of course. Right, now we move on to the fourth movement, the Cabaletta. And here the solo song is interspersed with choral episodes and comments from Enrico and Raimondo. So it, this is a rather odd, irregular organization of what should be just a solo, brilliant, 
performance for the for the soprano. I don't want to interrupt. Just before Netrebko starts the da capo of the cabaletta, the producer's idea is to bring in a doctor who gives Lucia an injection to calm her down. It's you know an idea sometimes of these updated uh, uh, production. But anyway, here we are. Plus harmonic again. So here we are. This is the end, almost the end. Then she dies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, uh, I might finish with a personal confession. I'm mad about opera. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you very much. There we have it. <laughs> Man about opera. Yeah. <laughs> very good. As always, um, we we'll, we'll welcome the Zoomers to join us on the big screen. Hello, Zoomers. Um, and we, uh, Matteo will take any questions or comments, points you want to make. Um, the form, as always, is in the room. Put your hand up and I'll bring the microphone to you. And if you're on the Zoom, you can put something on the chat and I'll read it out for you. <laughs> or if you want to talk to us, raise your hand or just simply unmute and we'll hear you in the room, which is always nice when people talk to us. So do we have anyone who wants to break the ice and um, make a comment or ask a question? On silence. I, I wanted to know um, about that wonderful production of um, Lucia. Where, where was it? And when was it? Uh, um, when when was it? And where? Uh, now let me. Uh, this is a few a few years ago. Um, Two thousand and nine, and the producer was Mary Zimmerman. 2009, the Metropolitan Opera in uh, New York. It's not the only uh, production uh, that uh, uses the glass harmonica. This is a splendid production from the Teatro La Fenice in Venice with Nadine Sierra, where she comes in with a glass and rubs the glass. And you see a table full of glasses, <laughs> the glass harmonica becomes really a number of glasses, and she's a really another great interpreter of the world. Nadine Sierra, uh, 2016, the Teatro La Fenice. You can find her online if you're interested. Because this was also at uh, the Met of it, another very yes. fine soprano, yes. another good actress. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, Duncan, wait one moment. Wonderful talk, thank you. Can you just say something about how difficult it is for the singer to sing lying down, falling down, sitting down? Well, as I said, this is, uh, uh, it doesn't happen always that way. This was Netrebko's own choice. It's, it's terribly difficult. If you're lying down over the orchestra pit and you have to, you know, first follow the conductor and then, you know, sing that terrible piece. It is really, it's it's a great performance, just that. And she, she has a good voice, as I said, and she's also a good actress, a good actress. Now she, I must confess that she has put up weight. Recently, there was a rather controversial clash between her and the Teatro alla Scala because of the Putin and the Ukraine war, et cetera. She's Russian. But she has nothing to do with politics, but the Teatro La Scala had something to object to her presence in the theater. And she gave it up. She renounced to sing at La Scala uh, right now, recently. Yeah. Um, a, a question from Isabel on, on the Zoom, who missed the beginning. Did you comment on the sleepwalking scene from La Sonambula? Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, there is quite a lot to uh, the sleepwalking scene is another beautiful example of a rather peculiar mad scene. It, it, it come to that, I must say that poor Donizetti, a few years before he died, he wrote one more mad scene in a beautiful opera, Linda di Chamonix, 1842. Fortunately, that was an opera semiseria, so it has a happy end and the girl, Linda, it's, it's set in the Alps, the Savoy, Haute Savoie, Haute Savoie. And uh, uh, she has a marvelous mad scene, but then fortunately things get uh, organized for her and she gets married, et cetera, et cetera, and there is a happy ending. But, and, uh, and uh, I mean, Donizetti had a special interest in organizing these things on stage. As I said, and that lots of critics, and uh, uh, other people say, may, maybe her, his personal condition, mental condition, encouraged him to turn that condition into music and song and theater. Anyone else in the room want to ask anything? Yes, we got a couple more in the front row. Hello, I'm, I'm curious to know your opinion of Alice's uh, rendition of, of Lucia. 
Sorry, uh, 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 Carlos's rendition of Lucia. No, I didn't. Ah, Carlos. Oh, yes. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. She's another, one of the great interpreters. I might add two Carlos, and she may be even greater. Joan Sutherland. Joan Sutherland. There's a beautiful recording. She is another great interpreter. Yes, Callas, definitely. But Joan Sutherland really uh, makes Lucia, creates Lucia, just like Netrebko does. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. We had one here. Never mind lying down and singing on your back, but in general, even if you don't do that, how long is one of those schemas with the four bits? It must require enormous stamina for a soprano uh, to absolutely. actually survive that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, do appreciate the fact, I mean, the Metropolitan Modern Theatre, do that in a big place like the Teatro del Maggio, which has an enormous space, a deep stage. Now they are working on it. And, uh, and you have to act and sing at the same time. It's really, I mean, it's really a demanding, terribly. Yes. The question for the Zoomers was how long was that whole band scene at the end of Lucia de Lanamo in total or four parts together? How long? The, the whole, the whole scena. Yeah, yeah. It's a good half hour. If you don't cut, as I said, uh, uh, it, the, it's abnormally long, the four movement standard scena as an extended recitative because Donizetti gives Lucia all the time she needs to make her point. Then the uh, cantabile, then the second recitative with the argument between her and her brother. It's, it's much longer, I cut it otherwise. <laughs> and, then, and then the final cabaletta. And you have to keep it going without any interruption. I cut it, but you have to keep it going. And at the same time, act and interact with the other characters on stage. It's, it's a really it, quite it, an ordeal. It, it really is the Everest for Sopranos. As, for some <laughs> yes. Yes. More questions or thoughts from anybody? No, on the Zoomers? Anybody out there want to talk to us? May, may, I, may I just yes. add one thing? Uh, uh, we have a big name, Verdi. If you wonder, did Verdi, uh, was Verdi interested in mad scenes? Indeed he was. We have a beautiful and popular opera, Nabucco. Nabucco, you know, as the famous uh, uh, choir, Va Pensiero. Well, Nabucco, the king, the protagonist, at a certain moment says, I'm no longer a king, I'm a god. Non so più, non so più resto un dio. And God strikes him with a thunderbolt and he goes mad. And there is a mad scene with Nabucco being uh, uh, punished by God for having been so uh, proud. And uh, also remember Macbeth. Verdi writes a beautiful sleepwalking scene with Lady Macbeth. She is really raving about the, uh, the the hands and the blood, etc. And much later, Verdi creates with Otello, so we are now in 1883, with Otello, Otello, you know, the jealousy, etc. A splendid, uh, uh, he loses control and he goes mad for a little bit. So Verdi, uh, shall I say, learned Donizetti's lesson, although, I mean, he was a man of another of another age. He was born in 1813. Donizetti died in 1848. And Verdi lived into the 20th century, died in 1901. So he belonged to a different age. But he appreciated the great interest that you can uh, uh, create by writing mad scenes or mad moments in great subjects like Otello or Macbeth or indeed the early Nabucco. Nabucco is 1842, like the Linda di Chamonix by Donizetti. And it has, do, do see it somewhere if you are interested. It has a, a splendid mad scene with Nabucco being struck by God with a thunderbolt.
It's very progressive of Verdi to have a man being hysterical. <laughs> um, okay, so one more question, and then I just wondered whether ordinary people, before we had drugs to stop psychosis and all the things that we see there, whether those sort of scenes, not as operatic, would have been things that people might have experienced and seen people in the throes of madness, which um, we never see now because people are locked up and have drugs. But I wonder whether it's something that people in the 19th century would have been able to relate to. Uh, yes, as I said, I mean, we are now uh, in a different age. Uh, people did relate to Lucia. In an, uh, do you know Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert? Well, if you read the passage where Emma Bovary goes to the theater in Rouen and she relates to Lucia, and, 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 and they, uh, they see Lucia, Lucie de Lamermoor. It was a terribly popular opera in France as well. And also, and also, uh, what's the other one? By an English writer, I can't remember now. A room with a view? No. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, uh, they do relate to the, the opera and they bring the opera close to their own personal uh, situation. Uh, the case of Emma Bovary is literature, but it did happen also in Italian society at the time, at the time when opera was the main or unique kind of entertainment for everybody, rich and poor, in these big, beautiful opera houses. Wherever you were, even in my little hometown, there, was a the there is a theater. It is an opera house. And if you go around uh, Tuscany, even a small place has, does have an opera house. So that like, like TV nowadays, opera was for everybody everywhere. Okay. Indeed. Um, famous scene in, in um, EM Forces where angels fear to tread happens in the opera house. Jennifer at the back is getting the last question. <clears throat> It's going to be, and I'll probably get into trouble for asking it. Am I right in thinking that opera um, has more scenes of women going mad than men going mad, which is not the same in the theater? Sorry, men? Uh, opera does mad women more than it does mad men. You, you don't ah. see a lot of men breaking down in opera, as opposed to theatre, where you have crazy men? Uh, well, yes, it depends on the period you, we are considering. I did mention the number of operas that feature or the Mad Orlando. I mentioned only two, but <laughs> there's Roland, there is an Orlando by Piccini. There are lots of uh, pa Orlando Paladino. I bet that, that's meant to be funny. But, and so that, that's a man, that's a man. There are other operas that feature male uh, mad characters, but the majority I must say is female, female. I'm sorry. <laughs> on, the chat, is, on, on the chat, Isabel wants to know whether Puccini did mad scenes or was he, so if, whether Puccini did any mad scenes? Puccini, did he do mad ah, scenes? Ah, Puccini. No, no, it didn't go that far. <laughs> okay. Lucini was not the kind of man that would go for madness. And the very, very last question. Um, uh, not a question, but a, a comment sort of to that almost last question, which is um, as a opera composer myself, it's not particularly fun to write a mad scene for a low voice. <laughs> There's not a lot of uh, yumminess in that. The yumminess is writing it for the high voices. And in fact, the early Orlandos, the male characters were high voices. Correct? Is that true? Sorry, I, I didn't quite, I can't hear properly. Yeah, I'm, I'm making the point that mad scenes work better with high voices, now for the women. And, in, and the point was that Orlando was often uh, done as a uh, castrato or countertenor. Ah, ah. Yes. 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 Uh, I must say that statistically, women do sing male roles over decades of history of opera. 
And this is true also at the time when Castrato, Castrati were still, were still in business. Okay, there, is, there was this strong competition. I mentioned Fanita Kinardi Persiani. There are lots of great female interpreters of Orlando or other characters. Uh, I want to mention Nelly Melba, Nelly Melba, a great singer for whom apparently that cadenza, which I said is not by Donizetti, was specifically written to let her show off her a uh, great voice and their coloratura, a, a technical, a technical ability. Yeah. I think we're going to wind it up. There's one more comment here. Uh, thank you for a highly interesting lecture from Isabel, all the way from Scotland. So that's very good. So we'll, we'll say goodbye to the Zoomers now because you can't join us for for wine. Um, but you can come back next week when we're coming back to Florence for a visit to the Sala Niobe, which is a Beautiful overlooked gem at the top of the Uffizi, and Alex Lawrence will take us there in, in some detail. Um, but for those who are here with us in Florence, we're going to have some wine in a moment, and you can come back tomorrow for the concert, uh, a piano recital by brilliant young Spaniard, um, and where there'll be also good wine. And our wine sponsor uh, this month is uh, Tenuta Deli Dei, um, who really given us a very nice. Uh, wines from near Panzana, which we're going to drink now. So thank you very much indeed, Matteo, for a fabulous lecture. See you later, Zoomers, from all over the world. There's Barbara on the West Coast. Yeah. Um. Uh, and